All right, if you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 20, we're going to look at this passage of Scripture this morning and just focus on one small part of that. We're going to want to continue our emphasis on healing until we feel like the Lord is, is ready for us to move on from the topic. I believe He still wants to heal, restore, mend, and radically transform our lives and our physical bodies. You know, we want people to be set free. We want addictions to drop off. We want depression to lift. We want uh, pain and sickness to flee in the name of Jesus. Yes. We've been hearing some good reports of what God has been doing. And I'm just, just so excited about that. And God has been so good. We're just going to keep believing. But today I really want to challenge you and hopefully increase your faith this morning. I'm preaching on outrageous faith. How many are ready for some outrageous faith? Yeah. Awesome. Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse 14. At the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. And a man came and knelt before Jesus. And he said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Jesus said, you faithless and corrupt people. How long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon in the boy, and it left him. From that moment, the boy was well. Afterward, the disciples asked Jesus privately, Why couldn't we cast out that demon? He said, You don't have enough faith, Jesus told him. I tell you the truth, if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Let, let's read that again. He says, you don't have enough faith, Jesus told him. I'll tell you the truth. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. So I want us to talk about this outrageous faith this morning. And the big idea of today's message is that God has given each of us, the word says he has given each of us a measure of faith. Or rather, what we're going to say is a starting point. Every single person, God has kind of given you a little bit of faith as a starting point, okay, which is enough to lead you to salvation, to healing, and a Holy Spirit baptism. Now here's the thing, that the more you and I exercise the faith that we are given, the stronger it gets. In other words, it's like a, a faith muscle, right? It's a faith, a spiritual faith muscle. The more we exercise that muscle of faith, the stronger it becomes. You know, when, when you hear what God is doing and when you see what God is doing, then when you come across somebody that is talking about how they're, they're sick or they're hurting, and you begin to share with them, your faith is much, much stronger. And so I had the opportunity this last week with someone that we were talking, and they just, we, you know, I wasn't talking about the sermon or anything. We were just talking about other stuff. And they're talking about, uh, you know, how they suffered from uh rheumatoid arthritis as soon as she said those words she must have thought i lost my mind because i got so excited okay and i mean i, I got excited not because she had rheumatoid arthritis don't misunderstand me i mean i just i really i started kind of doing this i was like oh oh i did that i really did i went oh oh i said god can heal rheumatoid arthritis i said my my god healed my daughter esther and she's been pain free for the last couple of years God is able to do that. We just start hearing what, what God has said. That's why the word says that we will overcome by the power, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of our testimony. As we share what God has done for us, what God has delivered you from, and what God has healed you from, you're increasing somebody's faith so that they can start to believe that, hey, if God can see, what I want them to, to walk away saying is, if God can heal that girl, he can heal me too. Yeah. If God can do that, surely he can do this. It's the same God that we believe in. And so we exercise that muscle of faith, and it allows us to move into a whole nother level. See, we're not just believing God for a moment of healing. We are believing for a lifestyle 
of health and wholeness. So we'll, we'll talk about that in another message about our personal responsibility as far as our bodies are concerned and our health is concerned. But I want to get to you this morning that the, the key, you've heard me say this, the key that opens the door of heaven for salvation with that measure of faith is the same key and it's the same measure of faith that opens up heaven. We have this morning, I believe last Sunday, you know, Sam led us in worship and there was a moment where he said, I feel like the Holy Spirit wants us to roar this morning. And he was telling me, he said, man, I've, I've never heard the congregation. It just was so loud and so powerful. They were really shouting. You know, they were really just pumped up and, and just something happened in the spiritual at that moment. I believe we ripped something open. We have an open heaven right now, but we want to move in that direction and allow God to continue to do things in our lives. But you and I have got to believe with outrageous faith for greater things. We want to see greater things because God wants to rejoice and we want to give him the joy that he deserves in seeing him heal people and minister to people and break off depression and addiction and drugs and everything else. God is able to do that. Amen. We were talking about healing in our class one Sunday in our seniors class and somebody, you know, some got, got on the subject of alcoholism and, and, and one of the guys, you know, said, well, you know, once, once you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. And boy, Brother, Brother Bray almost jumped up out of his seat. He almost jumped up out of his seat. Oh, no. He's, no, no, no. He says, I was an alcoholic, but Jesus saved me and transformed me. And the Bible says, you are a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have been He's ready to fight. I thought, oh, we're going to a wrestling match. He's going to wrestle him down. You know, that would have been fun, by the way. I would have got my video out. Come on, get him, Brother Ray. Get him. <laughs> that faith rises up in you. Yes. Listen, we don't have to listen to what the world says. We need to hear what God's word says. The gospel message of salvation through Jesus Christ cannot and must not ever be separated from the message of healing. They go together like a hand in a glove. In fact, they are indeed inseparable. Every time Jesus sent out his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, he sends them out. When he sent them out, he said, always preach the gospel and heal the sick. Preach the gospel and heal the sick. Sometimes he'd say it the opposite. He said, go there, heal their sick and tell them that the kingdom of God has come nigh. He's like, okay, that's our marching orders yes. is to go out and to pray for people expecting God to move on their behalf and to show his glory and to bring joy. It would bring great joy to people, right? If you got healed, how many of you, the Lord has healed you maybe in the last few weeks, the Lord has done something in your life and man, you, maybe you can't even explain it, but something inside you, you know, uh, Jenny was saying when, when we gave that roar, that the Holy Spirit spoke into her life. And she said, I, I saw the enemy like running back in fear. And God was realigning and recalibrating bodies. I saw that in the spirit. I said, I will take that because I believe that that's true. That God has begun a new work. And so something happens inside of us when the Holy Spirit begins to move. And our faith is increased. We may not even be able to put a finger on it. But eventually you're going to start seeing God do some good work in our bodies and healing as we continue to move in this area. Now I want us to look at the scripture this morning that we're at in Matthew chapter 17. The first thing that I want you to see in this story is that people are in great need of deliverance. Yes. People are hurting all around us. We've got broken marriages, we've got broken homes, We've got abuse of, of all kinds, child abuse to elder abuse and spousal abuse. I mean, we've got all kinds of things happening in our world. You add a sickness and disease and you add all the trauma that, you know, just living in this culture and living in this world can do to us. Uh, we need some help. <laughs> we need some help, you know, and people are in, in desperate need. And so as the disciples of Jesus come down off of the mountain, 
Jesus encounters the disciples having this great discussion, okay? They're having a discussion with the scribes. The Bible says that the scribes are the teachers of religious law. They are there and they're arguing. They're having this theological debate. Now, now I want you to catch this, okay? They're having a theological debate when Jesus shows up. And in one of the passages in the other Gospels, Jesus actually asks them. They never answer him, but he asks, what is it that you're questioning my disciples about? And of course, when he says that the father steps up and kind of talks about what is going on, the father basically complains about two things. I want you to catch this. Number one, the extreme case of his son. The condition of his child is extreme. And so he comes to Jesus kneeling in humility. And he cries out, Lord, have mercy. The child is lunatic, has seizures, is mute or dumb, and is suicidal and demon possessed. And he says, and he is my only child. Listen, I mean, just talking about that, if you stop and think about that, that, that will move you. It's your only child. And he's, he's having these horrible seizures and, and it, it's causing it to be, become suicidal. There's, there's a real need here. Okay? There's a real need here. So his first complaint is about that. The second part of his complaint is very simple. He says, and I brought him to your disciples and they were unable to help he complains about the powerlessness of the disciples. Can I tell you something this morning? That is an indictment against the church that there is so much need around us. And we're sometimes so busy tearing down other ministries or talking about other preachers or getting into ridiculous theological debates. But what ought, we ought to be focusing on is that the need is so great around us that we ought to be busy about our father's business. And the world levels the charge against the church and says the church is powerless. I don't go there. Ain't nothing happening. It's not but a mess. You saw what was happening in Pennsylvania in, in that situation. I mean, it's just horrible. This is a horrible situation. The church not only has become powerless in some situations, but it's become antagonistic. And instead of even drawing people to Jesus, it's actually pushing them away or even suffering some type of church or religious abuse, even physical abuse in many cases. And so the, the world looks at the church and says, hey, we are in great need, but the church doesn't have something to offer. Does the church have a message of life? Does the church have any power left in her ranks? And I'm here to tell you this morning that our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no mountain that he cannot move if we put our trust in him. It's not about the church. It's about Jesus Christ. And we turn our faith and we center it on Christ Jesus. We're believing that God wants to continue to move in this area. They could not. They were questioning. They were having their theological debate. But I want to talk to you about this faith. It was a misplaced faith. The fallacy of the faith formula. Some of you have heard the faith formula. And, you know, maybe on, on different uh, ministries and preachers to talk about you have, you have to have enough faith. Or you have to have the right kind of faith. Or, or you don't have enough of the amount of faith. Or you're just not doing it. You know, you're, you're just not saying the magic words just right. For the thing to happen in your life. And, and we hear that, you know, if you just name it and claim it. How many remember the name it and claim it? It's still out there. It's not anything new. It's been out there before it became popular uh, in, in, our, in our culture. It's been going on forever where we have this idea that if I just speak the positive thing, you know, and, and there's people, oh, I have a headache. Oh, no, no. I better not claim I have a headache. Listen, if you got a headache, you got a headache. It's not going to make it any better, any worse. Come on, can, can you just go ahead and accept if you're sick yeah. instead of being afraid? Oh, no, I can't claim it. Really, you have that much power in your words that you're afraid that if you actually say you have a headache, it's going to get worse or that it will never go away. I mean, that's just it, it gets to a place where it just becomes silly that if we, we believe this, and, you know, they got you believing for wealth. And prosperity, and if you just name it, claim it, you know, I, I use the words blab it and grab it. Just blab it and grab it. You know, God has promises this and God has promised if you just if you just hold on to it, grab a hold of it, it'll be yours. You know, if you just speak positively, that's not what it's about. It's not about I, I'm a positive thinker, okay? I'm a positive thinker. I'm a, I'm a, I consider myself an incurable optimistic, okay? 
I'm very optimistic. I always look on the, the bright side of things. And so, you know, it's not about being positive. That, there's, that, that's great and good and well, yes, and there's power in our words, but not to that extreme where you can just go ahead and, you know, well, we'd all be claiming the lottery. You remember that movie uh, where the guy becomes God and, you know, he gets the request on the computer and he gets all these requests for everyone. They pray to win the lottery. How many remember that movie? He gets so frustrated, so he hits the, yes, you can win the lottery. Of course, the next day, everybody won the lottery, right? Everybody won the lottery. Everybody got like a dollar or something, a couple of hundred million uh, jackpot. Well, they got their prayer request, didn't they? But that's not what we're talking about. The focus, when we talk about this misplaced faith, I want to read a quote. It says from Authority Hill from this book that we're studying. He says, I welcome the call to aggressive faith, but when faith becomes a technique to manipulate the power of God, it becomes destructive. Yeah. Let me say it again. I welcome the call to aggressive faith, but when faith becomes a technique to manipulate the power of God, it becomes destructive. See, this type of faith is faith in faith. It is a misplaced faith. The focus is on you. It's a human-centered faith. In other words, if we repent enough, if we pray enough, if we believe enough, if we fast enough, if we check all the right boxes, that God will come through. That's not the kind of faith that the Bible talks about, okay? As long as you and I keep focusing on our own strength, on our own power, or on our own faith, we're always going to fall short. But if we cry out to Jesus, if we just simply believe God, what is faith? Faith is just simply believing that what God said is true. That's it. It's that simple. Faith is believing that whatever God said, especially about His Son Jesus, and whatever Jesus, that what He promised, what He said, that it is true. I may not understand it, and I will never probably ever understand it until I get in glory, and maybe not even then. But right now in this world, there are still some gray areas that are beyond our theological understanding, which is why there's so many different theologies and why one person believes this or one person believes that, because we don't quite understand. And I just thank God that he's not waiting for me to figure it all out in my little noggin that I've got to have the absolute right perfect theology before he can move in my life. I'm glad he is moved by compassion. I'm glad he's moved by mercy. I'm glad he's moved yeah. by love. And he says, oh, that poor kid, he doesn't know it all, but I love him anyway. He is my God, and I'm going to do something in his life. Thank God. Aren't you glad that he's not waiting for you to get your faith protocol in order? We never, thank you. He said, I never have, and you never will, because we're not ever going to figure it out, are we? No. The emphasis is on us, on me. The disciple said, why could we not cast him out? What, what happened in chapter 10 of Matthew, if you go back, he sent them out, and they came back. He told them, everywhere you go, heal the sick, cast out demons, and preach the kingdom of God. They come back, and they're saying, oh, wow, that was amazing. Man, it was awesome. Jesus, even the demons are subject unto us in thy name. They came back a rousing success of ministry, healing, and preaching, and salvation being proclaimed. I mean, they were just so pumped up. And Jesus, he stops them and he says, instead of rejoicing over power over the demons, rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yes. Because salvation is the greatest miracle that you can obtain. It is a radical transformation of your mind and your thoughts and your beliefs and your whole spirit inside of you to change completely your direction. And so Jesus basically saying, listen, salvation is a greater work. Okay, now remember I said at the beginning you have a measure of faith. That little measure of faith is given to you so that you can believe. Well, if salvation is the greater work and you are saved, then everything else... Come on, somebody help me preach it this morning. The Apostle Paul said that he did not withhold his only son. He said, then how could he not with his son give us, and this is his word, all things. In other words, he's saying, son, he has given you the best in his son, resurrected him from the dead for you 
Let him go to the cross for you. He said, you think God's going to sit back now and withhold this smaller stuff of healing or casting out demons? He says, no way. So what I'm here to tell you this morning, if you have had enough faith to believe, right, to salvation, then you've already got past the bigger section of the most important part. The rest, can I say it this way, we're in the South, is gravy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. How many of you love gravy? Oh, y'all hungry already? I wish this was gravy right here. Oh, sausage and biscuits, smothered in gravy. Listen, right? Yeah. Go to that men's ministry. We went to that, that dinner. They were giving us some chicken fried steak. She put a little bit of gravy. I said, no, sweetie. Uh-uh. No, no, no. You slather that gravy just where you want it. Everywhere. Everywhere. Thank you. Everywhere. The gravy goes everywhere. I mean, yeah, the meat is, a, the chicken is a main, I get that. It's the main dish. But put that gravy on there. I'm telling you, salvation is the main dish. Healing and casting out demons is the gravy. What? So if he's already given you the chicken fried steak, come on somebody, help me out this morning. Hallelujah. He's already given you the chicken fried steak. Well then come on with the gravy, Lord. What? Depression has to live. That's the gravy. Addictions have to break. That's the gravy. Come on now. Sickness, it has to go. That's gravy. that since they had previously healed many who were sick and had cast out many devils that maybe somehow they were the source of the power that was doing the miracles and so it is a lifestyle of prayer and fasting that we're able to maintain our perspective on who the real source of our power is when our eyes are fixed on Jesus the author and finisher of our faith everything else is just gravy and faith has been watered down hell hostage to those who preach positive confession or speak the word of faith, just name it and claim it. The clear impression is that enough of the right kind of human effort can get God to do almost anything. But if we're going to talk about faith, you can't do it without talking about Hebrews chapter 11 with the heroes of the faith who accomplished so many things. But I want you to see this. It says, we find those who by faith won great victories while others by faith suffered and died. Oh wait, we don't want that part. We don't want the suffered and died part. We just want the part of great victories. You know, we, we want to do these great things and the great works for God. But when you hold on to your faith in the midst of your trials and you make it all the way through, that's why Paul said, I have run the race. What? And I have I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith, he said. Faith. Immediate vindication and total victory were not permitted to the Hebrews. They have been saved for the end of the age. So this morning, I want to tell you about our righteous faith. The devil tells you, and sometimes we hear it, well, you just, you're just not believing right, or it's just not, you know, what's going on here. But Jesus, with the power of his spoken word, simply told the demon, come out right now. And that demon had to go. There is power when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. A lot of times we say, well, where is this God of Elijah? But I believe God is saying to us, give me something I can work with. Where are the men and women that are not afraid to pick up the mantle of ministry and cry out, where is the God of Elijah? The God is saying, give me some of those kind of people that are not afraid to believe, not afraid to take a step of faith, not afraid to believe for greater things and quit worrying about, oh, I'm going to look bad if nothing happens. Don't worry about it. It's not your problem. You can't save anybody, but you still tell them about Jesus. You can't heal anybody, but Jesus does the healing. Your part is simply to trust and to obey and stay in God's word. Just believe that God's going to do that. God is looking for those kind of men and women of faith who are not afraid to pray for the outrageous, not afraid to believe for the ridiculous and the preposterous. Oh, and the unbelievable and the crazy. Just go ahead and do it. They already think you've got a few screws loose. Just go ahead and do it anyway. And pray for their healing and tell them about Jesus. Come on now. They already know you're a short of a full load. That's all right. 
Because the weaker I am, the stronger he is. And because we have this treasure in earthen vessels that are we're nothing but a, a crack pot that allows the light of Jesus to shine through. Because when they, things happen and you pray for them, they'll look at you and say, well, I know he or she didn't have any kind of, I know that person, they're crazy, man. Yes, it's Jesus in me, the hope of glory. He's the one who does the work. And I must decrease and he must increase he must increase we've allowed ourselves to be spiritually dumbed down by our world and by our culture by our wealth or by those around us like these scribes questioning and arguing and having theological debate and increasing our doubt but where are those mighty men and women of faith who will take this world by storm where are the warriors who are not afraid to pray to pick up their sword and enter the battle frame where are the ones who will ask for the outrageous, the ridiculous, the amazing, the extravagant, and the unfathomable? When God desires to heal, to save, to baptize in the Holy Ghost, where are those men and women who go out in the power of His name and lay waste to the strongholds of the enemy? Jesus has already bound the strong men. All we got to do is go in the household and loot the place. Yes. Amen. Did you hear that? Yes. Yes. Jesus has already bound the strong man. All we got to do is have enough gumption to go in there and take the loot, yes. take the treasures. Yes. While the strong man is bound up, go in there and set the captives free. Yes. How much faith is enough? So ridiculous. It's so outrageous. Jesus says, Jesus says, Jesus said, put the microphone back on. So, this thing fell off of me. I don't know what's going on with it. Uh, can y'all see that? Anybody, can anybody see that? Y'all lying. You say, you say yes. Oh, you see what I'm holding, right? Can you see what's inside of there? I think there's one in there. Now listen. Follow me for a second. Not literally, just <laughs> listen. Jesus says, I tell you, we have, if you have faith, the size of a mustard seed, You will say to this mountain, I don't know if he was pointing to mountain or pointing to the people that were sitting or what, but he was talking, right? He said, if you say to this mountain, get up and go throw yourself into the sea, it will obey you because nothing shall be impossible for you. Now, now let me tell you what Jesus is doing. He's using a big a speech that we call a hyperbole. How many, do we have any English teachers in here? Y'all you know what a hyperbole is, right? Where he says something that is so outrageously ridiculous. But he's doing that to make a point. So, so here's the point. Jesus chose something outrageously tiny on one end of the argument. And on the other side, he uses something outrageously enormous to get you and I to understand that in the spiritual, if you have just a little bit of faith, you can say to whatever mountain you're facing, whether it's a crack addiction, whether it's alcohol, whether it's pornography, whether it's greed and money, whether it's adultery, whatever, whatever it is, whatever mountain has got you backed up somewhere and is not letting you live life to the fullest, has stolen your joy, stolen your hope. And Jesus said, listen, if you, I think there's something in there. <laughs> he said, if you have faith the size of... He's saying, listen, guys. How many want some outrageous faith this morning? Yes. Can we give them some outrageous... Let's give, we're going to give you an outrageous faith this morning. Is that all right? Yes. Esther's going to help me out. Maybe, Emily, you can help her. We get, get through here. Some of them are, you can hang on your, your car mirror. Some are a little necklace you can wear. Because I, I want you, next time somebody says, man, I'm hurting, I, I need Jesus to hear me. Ooh, you're going to look at that and say, wait, 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 I know I got at least, I, le I got at least that much faith. 
He's saying if you want to accomplish something outrageously huge, all you need is something outrageously small, placed in the right place. If it is a Christ-centered faith, not faith in your faith, not faith in your power, not faith in your theology, not faith in your education, not faith in your knowledge. Oh, Pastor, but I don't know the right scripture to quote. It don't matter if you know the right scripture. You ought to get in the Word so that you can know the right scripture to quote. But it doesn't matter on your Bible knowledge. What it matters is on you just trusting God and obeying God. And for you to get out there and say, you know what? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out on the limb here. And I'm going to believe that God is able to set you free. I believe that God is able to break this thing. People don't even have to pray for you. Donna was sharing her a little bit of her testimony. She was a, a drug addict. She had a, some, what was going on with your veins there. I mean, it, poor, you, blood poison. Yeah. I mean, she had shot up all kinds of garbage and she was outside at home on her porch and she cried out to God. She said, God, they're going to take my babies. If they see this, if they see that I've been shooting up, if they see that I'm on this drugs and I'm not supposed to be, they're going to take my babies away. God, I'm crying out to you. You've got to help me. And she heard God speak to her. And God said, I will help you. And God, in that moment, on her front porch with no preacher, no worship, no band, nothing going on, right there, God responded to her and delivered her healed her, completely took away the desire for the drugs, totally radically changed her life. Now she has, she's been doing a ministry singing over there at the prison. Come on now. Yeah. Visiting the prisons and telling them about Jesus yeah. and singing God's songs. Why? Because God radically, and how much faith did she need? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. What? Yes. Yeah, no, no. You had that much faith. And that mountain of addiction was broken. Brother Ray, you had that much. I think there's something in there, Brother Ray. Thank you, Lord. That much faith and the power of alcohol was broken over his life. The power of rheumatoid arthritis broken with that much faith. Come on now. What? How many think that's absolutely outrageous? That's one of the most outrageous things I think Jesus ever said. Oh my gosh. I heard somebody tell me that they, they took it literal. They took it literal. Oh no, no. He said you can move a mountain. I'm going I'm to tell you something. Jesus Christ did not come all the way from heaven to teach you how to rearrange your landscape. <laughs> he is not interested because I guarantee you every, I would be the first one to be praying for Pikes Peak to be right over here somewhere. But as surely as I, I, I call Pikes Peak to uproot and come plant over here on top of a few people's houses that I'm not going to mention. <laughs> Just kidding. There's going to be somebody else in Colorado say, oh no, you're not taking Pikes Peak from us. They're going to call it back. Over. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about physically rearranging mountain ranges. He's talking about spiritual battles and spiritual warfare. And some of us are facing things that are so huge, it looks like a giant mountain. And so Jesus is telling us, if you just have this amount of faith, the Lord is able to work with that much faith. So it's, it's even more striking when he says on several occasions to the disciples, why did you doubt? Why did you not have enough faith? You've done this. You've already been instructed in this. You've been casting out demons. You've been healing the sick. Why all of a sudden the doubts? And so he gets angry and he says, you faithless and perverse generations, how long shall I be with you? He's kind of upset with them. He's chiding them because, like I said in chapter 10, they came back and said, oh, Oh, even the demons are subject unto us in thy name. They had gone out two by two. Here's nine of them and they can't cast out a demon. And he's upset with them. That's why he says it. Come on, guys. He said it's not that hard. What? Okay, wait a minute. What? It's not that hard. Wait, no. What? What? 
What are you facing this morning? Jesus is looking at it and saying, hey, I've delivered you before from some stuff. This is no different. This is going to go down just like everything else go down. If you put your eyes on me, I can, I've can. i healed you before. I can heal you again. I've provided before. I can provide again. I can do great things in your life. Just keep believing. Keep stretching that faith. Keep believing God to intervene in a big way in your life and in the lives of those around you. Strangers, family, whoever it may be, at the grocery store, at work, at the bank, wherever you're going to be. You know, just do it. Just step out in faith and do it. That is outrageous faith. Hyperboles are things like, I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. <laughs> or how about it's raining cats and dogs? Yeah, say that. that would be horrible. <laughs> that would be horrible. <laughs> that would be horrible. Dogs and cats falling from the sky, splattering all over everything. This would be horrible. Why do we even use that phrase? What do we, what do we, yeah, who thought this up? Has, has it ever rained a cat or a dog? If one dog fell from the sky and hit you on the head, wow. But hundreds of them falling down. And cats, meow, meow, meow. That's a hyper or how about another hyperbole? You know somebody, they're such a gossip, they can lick El Paso with their tongue. That's an outrageous statement. Jesus, you hadn't heard that? I get that's for free. That's free. No charge. No charge. You take that. Somebody starts gossiping. Somebody, you can lick El Paso with that tongue. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> you can follow along the rest of this message. I'm going to stop right there. I, I got so much more to talk about when it comes to faith. We, we could just keep going on this subject. But here, I, I want you to just, really, I just want you to look at that. And I want you to look at that compared to whatever problem you're facing. Whatever mountain you are facing. Whatever enemy has come against you. Whether sickness or disease or discouragement or depression, whatever it is. And you you look at that and you go, I gotta have at least that. I know I gotta have, especially if you're already a Christian, because if you're a Christian, you've are obviously already had at least that much of faith Amen. to get saved. And so the rest is what? Gravy. Y'all forgot the gravy thing already? The rest is gravy. The rest the Lord takes great joy in healing us. He wants to heal you. He wants to deliver you. He wants to set you free. He wants to chains broken off your life. He wants to give you hope. He wants to restore your joy. He wants to see you sing and dance and enjoy life like he meant it. He said, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it abundantly. God wants you to have an abundant life and quit being chained by those things in your life. Time to tear the mountain down, that song that they were singing. How can the mountain not bow low? It must at the name of Jesus because I got this kind of faith. This is outrageous faith. You wear it. You take it with you. And when somebody says, what you got in the little glass bottle? I got some outrageous faith in here. Let me tell you about it. 